What comes to mind when you think of the church? Is it community, worship, or hearing God's word? The church is all of these things. Jesus teaches that his followers will overflow with his joy. The church is God's community. It's where the joy of heaven invades the sadness of earth, no matter what happens in the world around us. The empty tomb gives us a reason to celebrate. Hopelessness is a lie. Pain is temporary. Darkness is defeated. And we're called to invite everyone to experience the eternal party God is throwing. You are invited to First Church. Well, hey, welcome to First Church. So glad you are joining us, whether you're here on site or online. I just looked and I saw that we have Doug and Sheila in Minnesota who are joining us online, as well as Tyler and Tara who are in Germany. So welcome you guys, as well as everyone else who happens to be in the internet world right now watching us. We're glad that you're joining us for worship, and it's also good to see you guys as well. Looks like we have a great crowd here on site. And if you are here on site, would you put your hands together and welcome in our online family. Let them know we're glad that they're joining us. Yeah. Well, today is going to be a good day for many different reasons. The first reason why today is a good day is because my Kentucky Wildcats beat the Florida Gators at the Swamp last night. So that was an awesome big win. Some of you guys are excited. The rest of you need to convert, but that's all right. Uh, it was a big win against the number 12 Florida Gators, and I was a little bit nervous going into that game, but I am on cloud nine right now. And last Sunday, somebody in our church was joking with me, and they said, oh, so Kentucky has a football team, and let me let you know something. Yes, we do. So I'm wearing my Kentucky this morning, and I'm proud of it, and I don't even care, okay? Now, the second reason why today is a good day is because our executive minister, Matt Thomas, and you all know him, Matt and Steph, for the first time this weekend, are grandparents, and so we're excited for them. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you see Matt, you may want to tell him congratulations, and you can call him Grandpa as well, because he's getting old. But yeah, we are excited for Matt, and it's definitely a fun time for them. And then the other reason why today is a good day is because this is week three of Your Invited, and we are excited for Superhero Sunday. We're excited for next week as well. Next week is our zoo day, and we're going to have like 40 to 50 animals here on site. There's going to be barrel train rides and pony rides and other games. There's going to be uh, food like corn dogs and popcorn and snow cones and all sorts of fun stuff. So you're not going to want to miss our zoo day next Sunday. All that stuff is going to take place after both of our services. Invite, invite, invite your friends, your family members, your neighbors, co-workers, whoever. Let them know that they are invited to experience the joy that we have here at First Church. And it's going to be an epic day. But I'm also excited about today. It's our Superhero Sunday. And so hopefully you've got to see some of our superhero stuff we've got going on if you're here on site. But I want to start off with asking this question. When you hear the word hero, what comes to mind? What's your first thought when you see the word hero, hear the word hero? A lot of people, what they first think of are superheroes, you know, like Batman and Superman, Spider-Man, maybe Wonder Woman or whoever. That's who they think about. Some people, when they hear the word hero, they want to be a superhero themselves, like this guy right here. This is Chris Morton, our junior high minister, and he looks like he's having way too much fun in that costume right there. It's the best he's ever looked, really. But um, Chris wants to be a superhero. I found out we have another staff member who also wants to secretly be a superhero. We got this picture this week. Can you guess who that is? Any guesses? That is Trotter, Andrew Trotter, our senior high minister, yeah. So that picture was sent to me this week and I thought I gotta put it on the, on the screen for you guys to see. So some people think about superheroes. Other people, when they hear the word hero, they think of real life, everyday heroes who risk their lives to save others, people like first responders, police officers, firefighters, those who serve in the military, those who uh, maybe are paramedics or healthcare workers who put their lives on the line in order to save other people's lives. And so we have a lot of first responders, everyday real life heroes that worship here at First Church and some firefighters that worship here ask us if we want to put some of our staff through some of the training that they go through and we could not turn down that opportunity. Take a look at what happened. J&J &J coming to you from Owasso Fire's training facility where usually our everyday heroes suit up and train. But today, 
The three men you're about to see, well, the only saving they might be able to do is through scripture. Now, Jessica, in each round of our competition, the person to complete the task in the shortest amount of time gets the most points. Well, let's start the hero challenge. Round one, put on full firefighter's gear. That's the pants, boots, jacket, helmet, mask, oxygen tank, and gloves. All right, end of round one, not surprising. Nathan, father of six with that win. He's used to the dressing and undressing of the kids, oh. his kids. Yeah. Yeah. Round two, pull the hose past the line, climb to the top of the building, rescue the dummy, and safely get yourself and the dummy out of the building. Round three, crawl through a smoke-filled maze and put out the flames. Very, very tight spaces for them to get through. Thermal camera footage showing Zeb excelling in this round. However, Nathan, ooh, he's struggling. I'm with the chief. If you were in a burning building, who would you want rescuing you? The only one I would want rescuing me would be Trotter. Not Zeb. Maybe Nathan, but not really. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Yeah, you can clap for that. You know, it makes me personally appreciate those who are actually trained to do that kind of stuff even more. After seeing our guys go through it, I'm glad we have those who actually know what they're doing, who put their lives on the line in order to rescue guys like me and people like you. So maybe when you hear the word hero, you think about an everyday real life hero, like first responders. Maybe you think about those who on this day, 21 years ago, 9-11, ran into the World Trade Centers as those buildings were on fire and getting ready to crumble and they risked their lives to save others. Maybe you think of someone else. Maybe what comes to mind is you know, a family member or a friend or a neighbor, somebody who made sacrifices for you and your family so that you could have what you have today or be who you are today, and that's a hero for you. There's a lot of different images that can pop into our minds when we hear the word hero, and I think it's a good question to ask, what do you think of when you hear the word hero? But I think an even better question for us to ask is this one right here. Who's the ultimate hero of your story? Because whether you realize it or not, we are all in need of a hero. We all need someone to rescue us outside of ourselves. And here's the thing, we are all in need of the same hero, whether we realize it or not. The problem is, the hero that we need the most is often the one that we turn to the least. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. In order to illustrate that truth, we're going to look at a very obscure passage from the Old Testament. It's found in 2 Kings chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles or a Bible app on your phone or tablet, go ahead and look up, look up with me, 2 Kings chapter 5. That's where we're going to study today. And we're going to look at the life of a man named Naaman. Now, like I said, this is kind of an obscure passage, but I think it has some powerful truth for us today that God wants us to know and God wants us to learn. Now, Naaman was a pretty powerful guy himself. He was a military leader, and Naaman, well, he was successful, he had great wealth, great prestige, he was famous, he was popular, he had a lot of authority, but Naaman, this powerful man, found himself in a pretty desperate situation, and that's where we pick up in his story. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1 says this. 
Now, Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man. Say those three words with me in green. He was a great man. Good, you guys are awake. Awesome. He was a great man in the sight of his master, the king of Aram, and highly regarded. Because through him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. Now, let's pause right there because there's a lot to unpack. First of all, we're introduced to this guy named Naaman. And what you need to know right off the bat is Naaman is not an Israelite, meaning he's not from God's people at this time. Naaman is actually an Aramean. And the Arameans were the enemies to the Israelites. And he's not just any member of the kingdom of Aram. He is the leader of their military. He is the commander of their army. And what you need to know that is that at this point in time, Aram was attacking Israel heavily. They were going in and taking over villages. They were plundering towns. And they were taking the Israelite people back as captives, as slaves. The Israelites didn't like Aram. And Naaman is the commander of the army of Aram. So he's responsible for a lot of this destruction, a lot of this heartache that's going on in Israel. But he's known for being a great man in his own country because he's been successful in attacking the Israelites. He's had victory after victory after victory. So he's known for being this great man who has a great reputation. He's a celebrity everywhere he goes. He's best buds with the king of Aram. But did you notice why Naaman was so successful? Look at what the text says. Because through him, through Naaman, the Lord had given victory to Aram. What? I thought that he was with the enemy. But God is giving him victory? God is helping the enemy Win battles? Yep. And here's why. Because sometimes God will use unconventional and unexpected means to wake up his people when they won't listen to him. God will try other things. But when we won't listen and we're not paying attention to him, sometimes God will use unconventional and unexpected means to wake us up, to shake us a little bit, to help us remember what really matters, to help us focus on him. God does this over and over and over again in Scripture. And so in this moment, God is using the enemy to wake up his people so that they will realize what they are missing. And I wonder right now, is there anything going on in your life that God might be using to wake you up? Is there anything happening right now in your life that you consider to be an obstacle or a hurdle or some tragic thing that maybe God is actually using to get your attention So you will pay attention to what really matters. When I read passages like this, I ask myself this question. What is it going to take for God to get my attention? To what extent will God have to go in order to wake me up? Because sometimes I can be pretty stubborn. And sometimes I can be so focused on me that I miss what God wants me to see. And so God has to wake me up in a way that I don't like. And that's what's going on here. But here's the thing. It's not just that... Israel needs to wake up to what God wants them to see. God is also trying, apparently, to wake up Naaman as well. You might be thinking, wake up Naaman? I thought he's part of the enemy. But here's what you need to understand. Yes, Israel in this day and age was God's chosen people. But being God's chosen people did not mean that they were the only people that God wanted to save. They were chosen for a purpose, and that purpose was to go out and tell all nations, all people throughout the world about their God, because God loves everyone, not just the Israelites. He loves all people everywhere, and the purpose of Israel was to be a light to the rest of the nations so that they would come and know God. Israel missed that sometimes, but you see, God still loves Naaman. Naaman might be from a pagan country but he still loves Naaman and I think he's trying to wake up Naaman here as well and here's why look at what the passage says it says he was a valiant soldier but he had leprosy he was a great man but 
He was successful, but. He was wealthy, but. He was famous, but. You see, there's always a but. Maybe I can say that a little bit nicer. There's always an however, (laughs) okay? There's always more to the story. And you see, I've known people, and probably you have as well, who seem to have it all together. And they've got money and prestige and power and influence and stuff, you name it. But there's always a but. There always is a however. See, Naaman was a great man, but he had an incurable skin disease. He had leprosy. And this was very tragic because in this day and age, it was miserable if you had leprosy. You see, basically what would happen is you would have these patches of dead and rotting skin that would appear all over your body and then it would spread and eventually it would affect your vital organs. You wouldn't die right away. It wasn't, instant, it wasn't an instant death sentence, but it was an instant relational and social death sentence because leprosy was highly contagious. And so once it was known that you had leprosy, you had to isolate yourself from everybody else because no one else wanted to catch it. No one else wanted to get it. It was a miserable existence, and there was no cure. But here's the thing. We find out in the text that Naaman, even though he knows he has leprosy, is still serving as the commander of the army. How's that? Shouldn't he be in isolation right now? He knows it. But he's keeping it to himself. It's not well known yet. It's just started. And Naaman doesn't know what to do. He finds himself in a very desperate situation. See, I think what's going on is he's concealing this issue that he's dealing with, which is what great men do. Because great men don't like to admit when they're not great. And the same is true for us, if we're being honest. Great men and great women don't like to admit when they're not great. We want to act like we have it all together. We want to act like we're in control. We want to act like we're calling the shots. We want to cover up any issues we might be dealing with until we can't cover it up anymore. And that's what happens here. See, word starts to spread that Naaman has leprosy. And it first spreads within his own household. And there's this servant girl who serves Naaman's wife who finds out that her master has leprosy. And let's read on in the story. It says, Now bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel. And she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet, God's prophet in Israel, who is in Samaria he would cure him of his leprosy. So what I want you to get here, I want you to understand is that Naaman's wife has a servant girl who's from where? Israel. Why is she from Israel? Remember what's been going on here. Naaman and the army of Aram have been attacking Israelite villages over and over again, plundering them, destroying them, and taking the people back as captives, as slaves. And now one of those captives is a young girl from Israel who is serving in the very house of the man who is most responsible for all the destruction that's been caused in this girl's life. She's serving the wife of a man who has attacked her people over and over again, a man who has uprooted her from her home, taken her away from her family, robbed her of everything she had, her hopes, her dreams, everything. And now she's serving in his household. She's serving his wife. Now, here's the thing. If I was in this servant girl's shoes, I might be tempted when I heard that Naaman had leprosy to say, oh, well... That's what he deserves. That's what he gets. It's the judgment of God at its best. Now, you guys can shake your heads at me, but you all would do the same thing. I mean, don't act like that you're holier than I am. We all would think that at first, right? But that's not how this girl responds. 
She doesn't say, oh, well, you know, serves him right. Do you notice what she says? If only my master Naaman would see the prophet who's in Israel, who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. This girl wants to help out Naaman. Why? He's taken everything from her. Why? Because she is living for God's bigger plan. She may have had everything taken from her. She may not understand why she's going through what she's going through. She may not like the situation that she's currently in, but she knows one thing. God is still God, and he still has a plan for his world. And so she's going to trust in God's plan, even when it looks like everything is going against her. Because here's the thing. The true test of, of our faith the true test of our faith is not how we will respond when we have all of our questions answered. The true test of our faith is how will we respond when all we have is unanswered questions. And this young girl, she has a whole lot of unanswered questions. She has no idea why she's going through what she's going through. But she knows one thing, that if Naaman, this powerful man, can stand before the prophet of God, then maybe the prophet of God can change his life. The prophet in Israel at this time is a man named Elisha. I like Elisha a whole lot. In fact, I've been studying his life the past couple months in great detail. And I haven't really done an in-depth study on Elisha in my entire life until just recently. And you can ask our staff, you can ask our elders, because I lead devotions and staff meetings and elder, elders meetings all the time. And I've been talking about Elisha for like two months. They're probably sick of me talking about Elisha, honestly. But I don't think Elisha gets enough airtime in church, because he did a lot of incredible things that God asked him to do. And he had a great ministry during a really rough period in Israel's history. So I'm going to talk about him today. And the reason why I wanted to talk about him today is because... God uses him to wake up a man who thought he was the hero of his own story so that that man could realize he needed a better hero. See, this girl says, if you go see Elisha, God's prophet, who God has done miracles through over and over and over again, he could possibly cure you. Because this girl wants to use this as an opportunity to do God's greater work. See, God uses our obstacles as opportunities to carry out his greater plan. And so when you do face an obstacle or a barrier, or you hit a wall in life, don't just get frustrated at your circumstance, but ask yourself, how does God want to use this moment? How does God want to use this in order to carry out his bigger plan? Because God often uses what we consider small to wake us up to his greater truth. And before this moment, Naaman probably saw this little servant girl as somebody insignificant, somebody who didn't matter, someone very small in his great mind. But God uses what we consider to be small to wake us up to his greater truth. And is there a small voice in your life right now? A small little factor, a small little small little whisper that's trying to wake you up to God's bigger truth, but you've been ignoring it because you consider it small, maybe because you consider it beneath you, something not important. The question is, when God tries to get our attention to the small things, will we listen? Naaman has a choice to make. Is he going to listen to the advice of this little slave girl, or is he gonna keep doing his own thing? Naaman decides to listen. Why? Because he's desperate. He doesn't know where else to turn. And when you're desperate, when you hit rock bottom, then you'll listen to anybody. And he listens to her, and so this is what he does. Naaman went to his master and told him, went to the king of Aram, what the girl from Israel had said. And by all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he goes to the king because he's got friends in high places. This is how great men operate, right? He could have just gone directly to Elisha, but he doesn't do that. Instead, he goes to his king, and the king writes him a letter to the king of Israel because, again, he's got friends in high places. This is how great men work. He's not going to go to some small little prophet. He's going to go to the king of Israel, the man in charge, and the man in charge is going to get something done for him. He's got this all figured out. I give Naaman a little bit of credit because he actually is willing to go to Israel, the enemy, for help, but he wants to do it on his terms. How else do we know that? Well, when you read on in this passage, it says that Naaman took with him to Israel 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and then 10 very nice and expensive 
outfits of clothing, as gifts, as payments. See, why does he bring this stuff with him? He's not going to ask for help. He's going to pay for a service. There's someone in Israel who can fix him, who can heal him, and he's going to go pay for a service. Is that how we treat God sometimes? And he brings a lot with him. I mean, 900 pounds of gold and silver plus 10 expensive outfits. Why does he bring so much? Well, he knows in order to get this treatment, he's got to go out of network. So it's going to be really expensive, okay? And he goes to get this treatment out of network in Israel. And he arrives in Israel with his entourage. All these great men with him who are by his side carrying this gold, carrying these clothes. He's got horses. He's got chariots. He enters Israel as a great man in this day would. And then he goes to the king of Israel for this fix. You know how the king of Israel responds? As soon as the king of Israel read the letter from the king of Aram, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel, pick a fight with me? In other words, the king of Israel says, what do you want me to do about it? I don't have that power. I can't cure you. What do you want me to do about it? Are you trying to pick a fight with me? So the king sends me this letter, and if I can't do it, then it gives you reason to attack us? I don't want to pick a fight. I can't do this. Why do you think I would have the ability to do this? And Naaman is left stunned probably because that's not how great men work in his world. In his world, if you want to access the power of Israel's God, you go to the most important man in Israel and in that, and in Naaman's mind, it was the king. Naaman has gone to the wrong source for help. And so Naaman is left empty-handed with no help. How often have you gone to the wrong source for help? You finally humble yourself and you're like, okay, I need help. Okay, I'll do it. But then you seek help in all the wrong places rather than actually listening to God and doing what you need to do. Because when we seek help in all the wrong places through the desires of this life, through pleasure in this life, through certain people in this life, through possessions or wealth or status or whatever you want, when you seek peace and satisfaction and comfort and fulfillment in all the wrong places, you seek the wrong sources, it just leaves you feeling empty. And that's where Naaman is. And Naaman doesn't know what to do now. He's traveled all this way, and the king of Israel says, I can't help you. But Elisha the prophet hears about what's going on, and he sends word to the king and says, send that guy over here. He should have come and seen me in the first place. And look at what happens. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots, his entourage, and he stopped at the door of Elisha's house. So Naaman, this great man, takes off to the lowly house of the prophet of God, this preacher of God, this man of God, and he goes to his home in parade-like fashion with all of his chariots, with all of his horses, with all of his gold and silver and clothes and resources. He shows up. And here's the thing. When great men showed up at someone's doorstep, they expected a great greeting. They expected a great welcome. Naaman is a big deal. And he knows he's a big deal, and he wants people to treat him like he's a big deal. But he arrives on Elisha's doorstep, and Elisha doesn't even leave his couch to go greet him. Elisha just stays put and sends one of his servants and says, uh, go out there and tell Naaman what he needs to do. Doesn't even meet him face to face. Look at what it says. It says, Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, to Naaman, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. That's it. And Naaman is ticked because he expected for the prophet to come out and greet him properly. He expected the prophet to treat him like he was a big deal. He expected the prophet to come out and make a big show I mean, he wanted him to come out and do his little magic trick or whatever he was going to do. He wanted him to do a performance that was worthy of America's Got Talent in front of him and all of his servants. He wanted to be wowed and impressed. And he wanted to be the center of the show. And instead, Elisha just stays on his couch and tells one of his servants, go out and tell him to go dip in the Jordan River seven times and he'll be cleansed. Now, what's interesting to me is that I don't think Elisha is being a jerk here. 
I don't think Elisha is trying to be disrespectful here. I think Elisha is trying to help Naaman realize who he really needs. To wake Naaman up. To humble Naaman, because Naaman needs to be humbled. Several years ago, when my son Alex was, I don't know, four years old or so, he was at his grandparents' house, my in-law's house, and they were carrying in some groceries. And he wanted to help, as little kids often do. And so he grabbed a gallon of milk and wanted to carry it in the house from the garage. And Allison, my wife, was there, and she said, no, 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 that's too heavy for you. And she tried to grab it, and he pulled back, and he said, Mommy, I got this. She's like, no, you don't. Here, let me help you. And she said again. He says, no, I got this. And about that time, you know, the grandparents who were sitting there, my in-laws, said, oh, let him carry it. He'll be fine. He says he's got it. That's what grandparents do. They just let grandkids get by with murder, you know. They just let their grandkids do whatever they want to do. They never let their kids get by with that kind of stuff. But they let grandkids get by, it, get by with it. And so Alex tries to carry the big jug of milk. And he went so far, and then he lost it. He dropped it, fell on the floor, and it busted, and milk went all over the garage floor and all over him. And Allison said that <laughs> Alex looked up from the milk that was all over the place, and he looked at her and said, Mommy, I don't got it. <laughs> but isn't this sometimes how we treat God? God's like, you don't need to carry that weight by yourself. I'll carry it for you. You never meant to carry that weight in life. And we're like, no, no, God, we got it. We don't need you. We got it. We got it. And God's like, no, you don't. This isn't going to end well. You were never meant to carry that weight. That's why you got me. Let me take it from you. Let me carry it for you. Let me carry it with you. Whatever he says, just do it. And we're like, no, God, we got this. And then there are other voices all around us that are saying, he says he's got it. She says she's got it. They're fine, God. And then we end up making a mess. And God's like, that's why I told you to give it to me. How often do we treat God with a, I got it, attitude? See, that's where Naaman is right now. Naaman still thinks he's a big deal. And the reason why Elisha doesn't go out to greet him is because he needs to realize that he needs a better hero. You see, Naaman's ticked. It says this, but Naaman went away angry and said, I thought, ooh, those are two big words right there, I thought. I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, do that little magic trick worthy of AGT, you know, and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. I thought he'd come out and make a big deal about me. I thought he would do more than just tell me to go dip in the dirty Jordan River seven times. And those two words, I thought, I think are two of the most dangerous but powerful words in this passage because I thought is often the barrier that exists between where God wants us to be and where we currently are. But God, I thought, I thought you would do it this way. I thought you would help me out. I thought you would fix this. I thought you wouldn't let me go through that. I thought, I thought, I thought, and we tell God all the time, I thought, and we never stop to ask God what he wants. I thought, God, and that's Naaman, I thought God would do it this way. I mean, I humbled myself enough to come and seek help, so I thought God would do it the way that I wanted him to do it. And that's not how God works. See, if we want our story to end well, God's got to be the hero of our story. We've got to do it his way. We've got to listen to him. We've got to humble ourselves and realize we are not the hero of our story. And if we try to be the hero of our own story, our story's not going to end well. We're all in need of the same hero. And that's our God, the only one who can truly rescue us and give us what our souls are looking for. Naaman hasn't quite figured this out yet. So in verse 12, he says, 
Are there not rivers of Damascus better than any of the waters of Israel? You want me to go dip in this dirty Jordan River, this poor excuse of a river? Aren't there better bodies of water that I could go and take a bath in? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and he went off in a rage. See, that's what great men do when they don't get their way. They go off. When great men don't have their expectations met, they go off. And so he went off in a rage, and he's ready to walk away from the power of God that God wants to display in his life. He's ready to walk away from it because of his pride. You ever been there? He's ready to walk away from what God wants to do for him because of his own pride and ego and selfishness. And then one of Naaman's servants comes to him and talks some sense into him. He says, hey, uh, uh, master, uh, if the prophet had asked you to do something that was like showy and big, wouldn't you have done that? So why don't you just do the simple thing he's asking you to do because it means you're not gonna have leprosy anymore. And Naaman realizes what he's getting ready to pass up on. Aren't you glad for those wise people in your life that can talk some sense into you when you need to have that done? <laughs> Aren't you grateful for those godly people who can look at you and say, hey, you're not being reasonable right now. I'm glad I had those people. I hope you had those people in your life. And so Naaman listens to his servant and he does what the servant tells him to do. So he went down and he dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. So he goes on and he does exactly what Elisha asked him to do. And here's the thing. When Naaman was dipping in the Jordan River, when he was getting ready to bathe in the Jordan River, before he could do that, he had to undress. He had to take off all of his armor. He had to take off all of his clothes. And he stood before all of his servants, his entourage, exposed, which is what he wanted to avoid. He wasn't just exposed in the sense that he was naked, but he was exposed because now everybody could see those leprous spots on him. And I wonder if some of his servants weren't looking at him and saying, oh, it's worse than we thought. He's fully exposed. He thought he could hide his problem, his issues, but now he's exposed. And here's a truth that I've learned the hard way in my life, but God can't heal what I hide. And God can't heal what you hide. If we're going to receive the life that God created us to live and wants us to live, then we've got to be willing to offer it all to him, to be fully exposed before him. And so Naaman does what God says. He goes down into the Jordan River and he dips seven times. And I want you to imagine what's going on probably in Naaman's head. He dips in the water the first time. Nothing happens. Because remember, the prophet said it's going to take seven times. So he does it a second time. Nothing happens. Third time, nothing happens. Fourth time, nothing happens. Fifth time, nothing happens. And Naaman is probably thinking, this is crazy. This is nuts. Why am I doing this? But he keeps on going. And he does what God asks him to do. Because here's the thing. Faith is trusting that God is God and I am not. And here, Naaman realizes this is out of his control. He's desperate. He's got nothing left so I'm just gonna trust that this God of Israel will do what he's promised to do. And after the seventh time of immersing himself in the water, he comes up in his skin, the Bible says it's like that of a young boy, totally clean. It's a powerful miracle, but here's the thing, the greatest miracle in this passage is not that Naaman's skin was changed, but is that Naaman's heart was changed. That's what God wanted all along. Look at what happens. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God, went back to Elisha, and he stood before him and said, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. In other words, the God of Israel is the one and only true God. Please accept now a gift from your servant. So Naaman goes back and he says, I know that your God's real. I know he's the only real God. And so now I want to worship him. Here, accept this gift. And you know what? Elisha will not accept any gifts from him. 
Because even though it was fine for Elisha to accept an offering from somebody, he would not accept gifts from Naaman because I think Elisha knew Naaman might be tempted to still take credit for this miracle. And so he says, no, I don't want anything. Don't give me anything. Because I want you to go back to your homeland knowing that God did this and you didn't. I want you to go back and realize that there is a better hero for you to live for. There is one beyond you that can give you what you're really looking for. God's going to get all the credit for this. And I don't want you to be tempted to take any credit for it. And so Elisha refuses any gift from Naaman. And Naaman goes back to his home country realizing who the hero is that he truly needs. Do you need a better hero today? I was going through some pictures on my computer the other day and I came across this picture of my son Alex. This has been a few years ago. It may be hard for you to tell, but he's actually wearing a pair of my shoes at that time. And he was walking around the house wearing my shoes, which were way too big on him, falling off of him. But he kept saying that he wanted to be like me. And both my kids have had moments like that when they've done something where they want to be like me or they're interested in what I'm interested in because they want to be like me. And a couple years ago, on Father's Day, Alex brought home this from one of his classes. It says, some people don't believe in superheroes, but they haven't met my dad. It's a picture of him there. And I remember when I got that, I remember thinking, I want my kids to respect me. I want my kids to see me as a good example. And I wanna be a hero in some sense for my kids. But in order to be the hero that my kids need, I need to introduce them to a better hero than me. Because if they get to the end of their life and the only hero they have is me or some other person, they're gonna be left empty like Naaman. I want them throughout their lives to know who the true hero of their story is and let him continue to work in their lives. So let me ask you as we wrap up today, do you need a better hero? Because that's why Jesus came. And he's here today ready to work in your life. And if you've been trying to do this on your own, he can offer you what no one else can give you. He came to this earth, died for your sins so that you could have forgiveness of sins before God so that you could live a new life, you could have a fresh start and you could have the promise and hope of eternity with him as his child and only Jesus can give you that. And he wants to be your hero today and throughout all eternity. The question is, do you need a better hero? Would you pray with me? Father, the reason why we can celebrate today is because we have a better hero. We have Jesus. And Father, I just pray that if there is anyone in the room today or listening online who doesn't know your son, Jesus, that before the day ends today, they would seek him because we're all in need of the same thing. We're all in need of a greater hero than ourselves. We all need your son. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen.